So today in section 3-2, we again deal with our angle pairs we learned yesterday in 3-1, but now it's a special scenario. Now they are formed when a transversal intersects two parallel lines. Not just any two lines, but specifically two parallel lines. And so then, if a transversal intersects two parallel lines, then corresponding angles are congruent. That is a postulate. Remember, postulates are just rules that we say, uh-huh, yep, that's right. We just accept them as true. Okay, so for example, in the diagram there, angle 3 and angle 1 are corresponding angles, so therefore they are congruent. Now, looking at the next one there, we have the alternate interior angles theorem. That is a theorem. That's why the number 3-1 is the same, because it's the first postulate, and then it's the first theorem. So please don't get confused in the two. I do like the fact that they give us names here. I would actually call it by name. I would not use the theorem number or postulate number. I would call all of these by name. Okay? But... Um, if a transversal intersects two parallel lines, then alternate interior angles are congruent. Now, we can prove that, of course, because in the previous uh, statement, we said that angle 1 was congruent to angle 3. Well, what can you tell me about angle 1 and angle 7? They're vertical angles, so therefore, they're congruent by our vertical angles theorem. Well, since angle... 3 is congruent to angle 1 by the corresponding angle's postulate, and angle 1 is congruent to angle 7 by the uh, vertical angle's theorem, then we know that angle 3 is congruent to angle 7 by our transitive property of congruence. Okay, so there I just kind of talked through the proof of that theorem. All right, so angle 3 is congruent to angle 7 because of the alternate interior angle's theorem. Good. Um, Taking a look at the next one down, theorem 3-2, same side interior angle. If a transversal intersects two parallel lines, then same side interior angles are supplementary. Again, look at angle 3 and angle 1. We know that those two angles are congruent by our corresponding angle's postulate. We know that angle 2 and angle 1 are supplementary. Why? And we have a linear pair postulate that says linear pairs are supplementary. Very good. So therefore, we know, and I'm shortcutting the proof here a little bit, but we know that the measure of angle 3 is equal to the measure of angle 1, because they're congruent. We know that uh, the measure of angle 2 plus the measure of angle 1 equals 180 degrees. And so therefore, we could use substitution and say, well, let's substitute angle 3 in for angle 1, right? Because their measures are congruent or equal. So then we would have that the measure of angle 3 plus the measure of angle 2 equals 180 degrees. Same side, interior angles are, in fact, supplementary. They add up to 180 degrees. And our last theorem, um, if a transversal intersects two parallel lines, then the alternate exterior angles are congruent. And we could see that a couple different ways. One way is if we looked at, let's see, how are they numbering this? Let's take a look at angles 2 and, ah, we don't even have to look at angle 2. Ah, sure, why not? Angle 2. There's angle 2 right there. So taking a look at angle 2 right there, what can you tell me about angle 4 and angle 2? What type of angles are there, for, first off? Corresponding angles. Corresponding angles. Therefore, our corresponding angles postulate tells us that angle 4 and angle 2 are congruent. Right? Right. What can you tell me about angle 2 and angle 8? They're vertical angles, and therefore, congruent by what? Vertical angles theorem. Very good. Vertical angles are congruent by the vertical angles theorem. And so now, since we know that angle 4 is congruent to angle 2, we know that angle 2 is congruent to angle 8. Therefore, we know angle 4 is congruent to angle 8 by the transitive property of congruence. Very good. So again, kind of talking through the proof of this one. 
Um, now, of course, do you have to go through that every single time you want to use this? No, that's why we have theorems, right? Theorems shortcut our proofs because somebody already did the proof for us, right? Somebody already did the proof for us. So we, if we have alternate exterior angles formed by parallel lines, you can say that they are congruent because of our alternate exterior angles <coughs> theorem. Very good. Any questions on these four postulates and theorems? Let's take a look at the example right below here. Identifying congruent angles, that one. Um, this one, they kind of have a, it's kind of a short proof, okay? It's kind of a short proof. Um, I know, looking at this, if they want me to justify that the measure of angle 5 is equal to 55 degrees, what's the shortcut way of doing that? Angle 5 and 55 degrees. How do I know? How do I know that angle 5, the measure of angle 5, equals 55 degrees? Right. They form that Z shape. Remember, alternate interior angles are Z angles, I called them. They form that Z shape, and so therefore, according to the alternate interior angles theorem, they are congruent. Okay? But they have this whole little proof thing down here. And so why the heck is that? Well, let's go ahead and follow their logic through this. The alternate interior angles theorem is the shortcut of this, okay? But they're trying to lead us through this. So they're saying that the measure of angle 7 equals 55 degrees. Why is that? Because corresponding angles there. Right, because those are corresponding angles, and we have the Question. corresponding angles postulate. Very good. Okay, then we have uh, the measure of angle 5 equals the measure of angle 7. How do we know that? Right. Vertical angles theorem. And so now they're saying, finally, two steps later, that the measure of angle 5 equals 55 degrees. Well, according to their three-step logic here, why do we know that? You could say the transitive property of equality. You could say the transitive property of equality. It would also be correct to say the substitution property of equality. Which is what I'm going to write down. Okay? There is no such thing as the substitution property of congruence by the way. So um, I definitely like to use substitution when I can. I can only use it on equality problems. All right. So there's the long way of getting there. But you're right. Those angles, angle 5 and 55 degrees, are alternate interior angles. And so we could simply say the alternate interior angles theorem tells us that the measure of angle 5 is 55 degrees. Everybody cool? cool. All right. Let's take a look at the proof right next to it. Proof right next to it. Now, in this one, in this one, I actually don't like how they did this proof. I don't know why they did it this way. I want to change a couple things before we work this together. Okay? So please, eyes up front, make sure you copy this down in your notes. We are not proving that angle 1 is congruent to angle 7. I want to prove that the measure of angle 1 equals the measure of angle 7. Okay, then I want to go ahead and say that step three, statement and reason three are gone. Statement and reason five are gone. They're just extra statements that we really don't need to prove this. Okay, so once we do that, now this is a more correct proof. All right couple of things. We are doing a two-column proof here. You guys know certain things that happen in every single two-column proof. So on your test last week, as I'm looking through these, I'm seeing a few people who just kind of gave up on that last proof. I said, hey, write a two-column proof. And some people left it blank. You are not giving yourself the opportunity to get points if you just leave it blank. You all know certain things about two-column proofs. 
that you all should have gotten points for. You all know that every single two-column proof is formed by two columns. You all know that the first column is labeled statements, and the second column is labeled reasons. You should all know that the first statement in a two-column proof is what? The given. So what do I write in my first column proof here, or two-column proof? Nope. A is parallel to B. A is parallel to B. That is what I write as my given statement, because that is what they gave me. And in a two-column proof, what is your last statement? Okay, what you're trying to prove. You don't actually say the word prove, right? The word prove is never in your proof. I've seen a few people who put that down as their last statement down here, proved. You do not put the word prove in your proof. Your last statement is the measure of angle 1 is equal to the measure of angle 7. So everybody, of course, not including these statements 2 through 7 here. So if those were gone, everybody in here should have been able to get a few points for just setting up your proof correctly, even if you knew nothing else how to do it. Okay? Don't give up so easily, folks. Don't just look at a proof and go, oh, it's a proof. I don't know how to do that. And give up. You know a few things. Show me that you know those things, and then I will give you points accordingly. Okay? All right, so we all know that this is true. Now, um, let's fill in the rest of our statements here. They tell us that statement two is because that if lines are parallel, then corresponding angles are congruent. So looking at our diagram, what corresponding angles should they be talking about? Corresponding angles. The corresponding angles have to form an F shape, right? 1 and 5 form an upside-down F, right? Upside-down and backwards F. So we know that angle 1 is congruent to angle 5. That is our corresponding angles postulate. We're going to skip statement 3 and reason 3 because it just really isn't needed in this proof. I don't know why they put it in there. So looking at statement 4 then. They say they give us the reason vertical angles are congruent. Hmm. What vertical angles? Angle 5 and angle 7. Angle 5 is congruent to angle 7. Okay. So then, again, skip step 5. Looking at statement six, they tell us it's because of the transitive property of congruence. Well, looking at statements two and four, what could we possibly say using the transitive property of congruence? Seven. Seven. Yep, and I'm going to write it in the order like they want me to write it for my final answer. So I'm going to say that angle one is congruent to angle seven. That is true by the transitive property of congruence. Very good. And then lastly, we know then that the measure of angle 1 is equal to the measure of angle 7 because angles with equal measure are congruent, right? So congruent angles have equal measure. I would have said, by the way, again, the way I write my proofs versus the way the book writes their proofs, I would have said that that's the definition of congruent angles. Okay, the definition of congruent angles tells me if they're congruent, they have the same measure. Okay? Questions on filling in this proof? Okay, let's take a look to the back side. Looking at the back side, we have a proof here. We'll talk about that tomorrow. I want to move on to the bottom of these uh, notes. Bottom of the notes here. We have a figure. Just looking at the figure, what can you tell me about it? Okay, we know it's a trapezoid. Very good. Good use of uh, vocab from previous years. 
What else can you tell me? What can you tell me about a trapezoid, then, if we know it's a trapezoid? It's two sides. Uh, lines. How about stuff that's pertinent to what we're talking about now? It's what? Uh, two parallel lines. Two sets of parallel or one set, we should say, right? We have two parallel lines, one set of parallel lines. Yeah, we got parallel lines. So when you guys look at this, what you need to start getting used to seeing is if you see parallel lines, imagine that those lines are going on forever in both directions. Imagine the entire line. Okay? Because now when I look at that, I see, oh, wait a minute, I've got this other line here, which we call a what? Transversal. That transversal is intersecting two parallel lines. What type of angles are being formed there? That angle 2x and that angle x minus 12, those are what type of angles? Same side interior angles. They are forming, let me draw it here, they are forming that C shape. They are forming that C shape. So if you don't know off the top of your head, make sure you look it up. What do we know then about those C shape angles or the uh, same side interior angles? That is not what we know. You're not looking at your notes. Same side interior angles are supplementary. Now, by the way, looking at this diagram, it should be obvious to you that they are not going to be congruent. Because labeling these angles, what type of angle is 2x? Obtuse. obtuse. What type of angle is x minus 12? Acute. acute. Can an obtuse angle ever be congruent to uh, an acute angle? No. no. So we know that they can't be congruent. But because of our theorems, we know that they are supplementary. So 2x plus x minus 12 equals 180. We can then solve this equation for x. 3x minus 12 equals 180. I've got to add 12 to both sides. So 3x equals 192. If I divide both sides by 3, x equals 64. Okay, so now we want to solve for y. Well, again, looking at that side of our figure, we still have our parallel lines, but this time, those parallel lines are being cut by this transversal. Okay, and those labeled angles are what type of angle pair? Yeah, don't say the same one as before. Actually, tell me the name. We got to practice vocab. They are same side interior angles. Same side interior angles, they form that C shape. Therefore, we know what about them? Be careful. They do not equal 180. They're supplementary, which means they add up to 180. They add up to 180. So 3y plus y plus 20 equals... 180. So now we can solve for y. 4y plus 20 equals 180. Get rid of the 20 on both sides. 4y equals 160. If we divide both sides by 4, what does y equal? y equals 40. Very good. Questions on this problem? Let's try the one right next to it. We're trying to find the value of y. Looking at the diagram here, what do we see? What do we have? What can, what, what can help us? We have two parallel lines. That is key information. So we have two parallel lines. Right there and there. Okay, but 
What else do we need to know to help us out? We got two different transversals. Yeah. That's crazy. We have two different transversals. So we've got to decide which transversal is going to help us solve for Y. The one, the horizontal one, not the one that's at a diagonal? Okay, so you're saying that this one is the one we need to use. Yeah. Okay. Now, I agree. I agree that that's the transversal we need to use. But you've still got to be careful in how you use it. Okay? Because look at here. If you look over here at the 80 degree angle, any angle pairs that you're talking about, whether it be alternate interior, alternate exterior, corresponding, or same side interior, they always have to be formed. One of the angles is formed by one of the lines and the transversal. The other angle is formed by the other line and the transversal. Okay? So looking at this, here's the first line. Here's the transversal. 80 is, in fact, formed by one of our parallel lines and the transversal. Great. Look at Y. Y is formed by our transversal and, oops, this other line. Oh, man. Huh. Look at the 40 degrees. Oh, man, 40 is formed by our parallel line and then, oh, man, that other line. So how the heck am I going to solve for Y? Yes, ma'am. Okay, why are we doing that? What can you tell me about angle Y in that 40 degrees? What are you doing here? Well, because um, if you combine the 40 degree angle and Y, then they're the same That's what I'm looking for here, absolutely. If we add together the Y and the 40 degrees, this entire angle is now a same side interior angle with the 80 degree angle. See what I'm saying? They now are forming that C shape right there. So, we can't find it directly. We have to go ahead and add up another angle with it. So, our first angle here is Y plus 40. The other angle we're using is then the 80 degrees. And we know that same side interior angles, when formed by parallel lines are supplementary. Okay, so solving this, we get y plus 120 equals 180. We need to subtract 120 from both sides. And so y equals 60. Yeah. 